Well, good morning, everybody out there. Um, it is on the hour. We like to start on time. Um, I like to say, unlike the flooring trade. And so uh, with that said, <clears throat> welcome to this NFCA education um, uh, webinar. A um, little bit about NFCA before we hand the mic over to, to Andre. Um, uh, NFCA has been around for 40 years. It's uh, really repurposed itself in the last six or seven years to take advantage of the internet and uh, put good messaging out there, create platforms for events like we're going to have this morning, where good people um, with experts in their field can come to a platform which is unbiased and just put that information out there for uh, the construction industry to take advantage of. Um, I ran into Andre about six or seven years ago. I uh, saw his talk at that time. And um, having been in flooring for many years, I um, thought, wow, this information is fantastic on a subject which has plagued and bothered us in, in the flooring industry for a long time. And that is, uh, you know, how do we solve II, high IICs, or sorry, sound transference using, you know, two millimeter or three millimeter underlay products that um, claim to offer a good um, uh, sound barrier. And as we know, it's... Um, the, the expectations uh, are, are very high and they, they just don't deliver. So uh, this sort of thing, as you'll find out from Andre's content, is um, really something that is dealt with, uh, should be dealt with at the architectural stage and not uh, uh, allowed to fall back on the idea that maybe a, a two mil underlay is going to solve the, the problems experienced by stratas, homeowners, um, um, property managers and everybody else involved. So uh, it's great content. That's what I thought when I first saw Andre do his thing. And um, he does it uh, in a way that's um, digestible and interesting. So um, do I have anything else to say? Uh, one thing about a little bit more about NFCA is that we offer specification guides to get flooring installed properly for uh, the architectural community and the construction managers out there. Um, uh, it's uh, important to understand some of the challenges that flooring brings. It's uh, uh, often not really considered how challenging flooring can, can be until the floor installer shows up and, for example, rejects the site conditions or rejects the site, walks off the job, and then everything grinds to a halt. The only way to avoid that is to have conversations early in the construction process and use the right specification language. So if anybody has any questions about that, you can reach out to us. Um, our contacts page is on our website, www.nfca.ca. With that said, I'm excited to hand you over to Andre and um, Fintech. Uh, great content, so enjoy, and we'll uh, talk to you again soon. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. Can you uh, can you hear me well? Beautiful. So, um, first of all, I'm super excited to be here. Um, well, you know what I mean? Uh, I've been at home for eight weeks now. So when I mean excited to be here, I'm meaning uh, with you all. A <laughs> um, um, couple thank yous before I, I start. NFCA, thank you so much, Chris and Lee, putting this thing together. Thank you for the opportunity for Acoustatech to be uh, speaking. There's a great turnout this morning where uh, we're going to be flirting with 150 people on the call uh, today, so that's amazing. So it shows that there's a level of interest in uh, in the topic, which is uh, which is amazing. So we'll try to share as much as we possibly can uh, on uh, on that topic. Um, also, want to thank my colleagues at Acoustatech that uh, uh, obviously uh, scheduled and worked on the webinars. Uh, also, want to thank particularly Frederick and Christian that uh, helped me. Um, join the 21st century when it comes to technology uh it uh, trust me when i tell you there was a lot of trial and errors because uh because again this is uh, this is a first for me on the webinar side of things uh but hey now that uh, we got it down we'll uh, we'll be uh ready to roll for the next ones i uh, also want to thank all of you for attending uh obviously you guys have very very few choices of webinars to attend uh <laughs> no uh, joke aside um we appreciate you taking your time on your day to uh to attend this one. Uh, and also it gives me an opportunity to wear a shirt for the first time in two months. So thank you so much. Uh, it uh, feels great. 
A uh, couple household items. Uh, Chris, by the way, do you would you do me a favor, bud? Can you uh, turn off your camera if you can? Um, I do know the PowerPoint quite by heart, but not that by heart. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Chris. Um, so ultimately, a couple household uh, things. First, I'm going to play a few videos uh, for you this morning or this afternoon, depending where you're at. Uh, so please uh, stay close to your volume um, buttons because some of the sounds are a little bit louder than others. So I wouldn't want anybody to uh, to jump off their chair or something. So just try to stay close to your volume button. Uh, also, for those of you that at some point, uh, if something comes up, and you can't make it till the end, uh, there's no issue there. Uh, since you've signed up, you can get the recording after the fact, and then you can rewatch it. Chris, as I said a little bit earlier, you can jump in at any time. We truly uh, value your, uh, your opinion uh, for, for you and your group. Uh, and also want to take advantage of the opportunity to wish Happy Mother's Day in advance to all the mothers out there. So let's uh, get uh, started. We'll try to make this as uh, painless as possible. For those of you that do not know who Acoustatech is, um, we're a company in head office based out of Quebec. We've been doing business uh, for close to, well, actually 20 years now. Um, and uh, we, uh, in a nutshell, what we do is we offer guidance and solutions for architects, developers, flooring contractors, flooring manufacturers, general contractors, uh, engineers uh, that are possibly frustrated with a few things. So in our experience over the years, we've come across a lot of frustration in this field, and uh, we've uh, basically made it our mission to, uh, to try to help out. Uh, so the possibility of acoustic complaints and or lawsuits, uh, which is quite common also with property management companies. I know a few of them are on the call now, so thank you. Uh, condo boards. So uh, ultimately, the possibility or the fact that there are complaints and lawsuits within your building. Uh, customers negative perception of the building. So I also work personally, so does my team, uh, with a lot of builders that ultimately are competing against concrete buildings, an example, and they're doing light frame buildings. And, and sadly, the acoustics and sound insulation within those buildings is not where it should, it should be. So we, uh, we to some extent, uh, collaborate and contribute and, and assist people in, in trying to find solutions for that. Uh, also, new code regulations, whether you're in the U.S., um, whether you are in Canada, uh, ultimately the code can be a little bit different. Uh, sometimes the code can basically dictate where we need to be on the acoustics. Sometimes it's even the weight. So as an example, uh, BC just introduced a new provision in the code for weight. So uh, obviously the code is, is telling you what you can and can't do, but this obviously impact on the acoustic side of things. So we also do a lot of uh, assistance on that front too. And uh, last but not least, abundance of products and unclear information. So lots of information out there, mind you. That's precisely why uh, with the NFCA, that's precisely why uh, the NFCA has an interest in putting this kind of information uh, in front of you all. So uh, enough about us. Uh, let's uh, get going with uh, the agenda for today. So I want to talk to you guys very quickly about acoustic principles. Some of you may have attended the uh, Lightwood Frame Installation webinar last uh, week. Uh, my colleague Christian out of Toronto did that, which uh, he did an amazing job. So thank you, Christian, on that. So uh, I didn't want this to make, make it too redundant. And besides, uh, I also want to make it more um, relevant to flooring. So that's the idea. That's why we're here this morning. So we're going to try to uh, talk about the principles that are mainly about flooring. Uh, I want to talk about structure types. It's extremely important to go through them. I uh, also want to talk to you about underlayment. Um, I want to talk to you about floor coverings, uh, basically what we've seen, what we've uh, uh, basically figured out over the years. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about assemblies. It's certainly not going to be the biggest part within the day, but uh, it doesn't change the fact that assemblies, I think, are important to see a little bit what's out there. Uh, and then we'll go to recap and takeaways uh, and question and answers. Uh, question and answers, uh, I can tell you right now, obviously, you guys can just raise your hand and ask me a question, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, I want to say it now that ultimately if you do have questions uh and ultimately you're not necessarily familiar with like sending it by email uh or at least on the platform uh rest assured that any question that gets our way or my way will be answered in a timely fashion so uh let's uh, get started again so let's talk about acoustic principles 
Uh, I want you guys to be a little bit more familiar about how acoustic works and what's out there. What are what's the code saying? Uh, what are people expecting? So that's kind of why I want to get into this. The STC requirement. So STC stands for Sound Transmission Class, and it measures basically the airborne sound. Uh, airborne sound being music, television, radio, people screaming, singing, uh, shouting, whatever it may be. Uh, if you look at the graph, uh, basically you'll notice that airborne sounds travel in all directions. So it's very important to understand that uh, if we are running into an issue or if we want to avoid an issue, well, we need to understand basically uh, what we're up against. So uh, because the IIC, which we'll talk about mainly within this uh, webinar, uh, has nothing to do with the STC to some extent. They're completely different animals and they're controlled completely differently too. So the airborne sounds travel in all directions, meaning you can have a sound that originates from a unit below that's going to travel up to the unit above, or you can have side to side. For your information, minimum STC required, that includes Canada and the US is 50. We're going to get through the data a little bit more in a minute, but I want you to know that the STC required is 50. Obviously, if you're an architect or a developer, you're well aware, or an engineer, you're obviously well aware of that requirement because it is in the code, it's by a law. So you have to pay attention to the STC. Minimum AFTC requires 47. The A stands for a parent. So my goal here is not to make anybody an acoustic engineer. As a matter of fact, there's probably acoustic engineers on the call. So hopefully I don't get in trouble. Uh, ultimately, we're trying to keep it simple. A parent, sound transmission class, the A basically is more of a, like the new field testing. So it takes into consideration flanking and the fact that when you're not in a laboratory, that it's most likely not going to perform like you would be in a controlled environment. Recommended minimum STC in Canada is 55. So the recommendation in Canada is 55, but the requirement is 50. Now let's get to the core uh, because once again, this is definitely related to flooring. Let's get to the core on the IIC side. So impact installation class measures the transfer of the impact noise. Impact noise can be walking, running, playing with a toy on the floor, dropping objects, moving furniture, anything in contact with your structure will be considered an impact noise. Um, which again, it doesn't work the same with an STC whatsoever because STC does not require any kind of bridging. It doesn't require to be in contact between two mass or two uh, components. So a few things here. Minimum IIC required in Canada is not applicable. So in Canada, you do not have legally a responsibility to do anything on the IIC. In the US, it's also 50. So to some extent, you have to be at IIC 50 in order for uh, to be basically to some extent uh, legal. The recommended minimum IIC in Canada, although there's no requirement, is 55. Okay. The expected from our uh, point of view, what we've experienced over the past 20 years, expected IIC is often over 55. So people, to some extent, when I say people, I'm talking about occupants, condo owners, renters, hotel room uh, attendants to some extent. So ultimately, people expect to be to some extent over that recommendation. That's most likely why the code to some extent suggests to be over 55, although you don't have to. Here's, here's the kicker. In real life, despite the high IICs we see out there, and we'll get through this in a second, despite the fact that expected IIC is over 55, in real life, often we end up seeing that the building is performing at 45 to 54. For sure, there's there's going to be times where all of a sudden things going to be, you know, there's going to be like things, pay, people have paid attention, they've done the right thing, and then the building is over 55, no doubt about that. But more often than not, people think that they are well over 55. As a matter of fact, they think they're at 72 or 78, and then we'll talk about that in a minute. But in reality, when you're doing a test, you end up showing something that's well under the 55 range. Another thing I want to basically ask you, and I know you can't uh, answer me, 
is the percentage of complaints. The percentage of complaints between the STC and the IIC is definitely well over the 80% range. What that means is 80% of complaints that, you know, in a condo or, or apartment buildings, wherever it may be, will come from the IIC. The irony of that is the IIC is, at least in Canada, not required by code. So let me ask you this. Do you think Mr. and Mrs. Smith the buying or think of buying a condo unit know what the code says when it comes to the IIC? Absolutely not. They have no idea what the code says. And even worse than that, they, have, they don't care. They truly do not care whether the code says anything or not. So what happens is, and we're a company that deal with the aftermath of that a lot. Ultimately, what happens is somebody moves in, people think they're in good shape, there's a complaint, there's a test being done and the rating shows up to be nor, not where the expectation was or what the builder or the property management company or condo board was expecting either. So ultimately, we end up with even more frustration. So now, if and then I'll explain to some extent what the IIC and how that works. Why high IICs? And who's asking for that? And why are they asking for that? High IICs, as far as I'm concerned, there's obviously more reasons than that, but to some extent, in my opinion, the reason that we see high IICs are that when, by the way, in some territories we see it, in some territories we don't. In high IICs, the reason we see that is because people are willing to throw out high IICs associated with their products. So ultimately what happens is, just use an example, a condo board is asking for 65 or 72 and all of a sudden, they're still running into issues. So somebody else is publicizing or publishing a 74, but they're still running into issue while we're going to increase the requirement in our building because it's obviously not working. So the problem with that is it keeps going up and up and up. So all of a sudden, we're all stuck in this beautiful industry, that's the flooring industry, dealing with requirements or expectations that are completely not realistic. And it's a vicious circle that keeps happening and happening. So I don't know, Chris, if you want to add anything to this, uh, be my guest. But from our experience, one of the reasons we want to put this webinar together is exactly that, is to try to stop the bleeding and find a way to all come together and change the way that ultimately we're going to do things. And I truly believe, and my company truly believes, that we're going to change uh, to some extent, that we're going to just better um, you know, the, the well-being of the occupants, whether it's in a um, hotel room, uh, a, a suite or a condo or whatever it may be. So an IIC rating, so just so we understand how it actually works, there's a tapping machine on top of a floor and there's a receiving machine in the unit below. That tapping machine makes a wreck, it's super loud, creates obviously a vibration, microphone in the unit below is actually capturing what's actually going through. So let me ask this, what are we actually testing when we're doing an, an, an IIC test? Well, I'll tell you what we're not testing. We're not testing a floor. So when people say to you, those of you that are flooring manufacturers out there, flooring contractors, what is the acoustic rating of your floor? That's the wrong question to ask. Are we testing an underlayment? We're not testing an underlayment on its own. We're not testing a layer of drywall. We're not testing a concrete slab. We are testing every single component that you're gonna see between the tapping machine and the receiving machine. So the question that we should ask ourselves that people should ask us and keep us accountable in the flooring industry is, why is it that you're associating a rating to your underlay or to your floor? or to your whatever component you'll find in the ceiling. So this is also one of the issues that we see out there is there's no such thing as a rating associated to a product. Because if I wanted to, I could take this piece of paper and I could literally make it say whatever I want. It only depends on how I'm testing it and with what. So to illustrate that, I'll show you a little bit what we're dealing with. 
So for example, out there we see AIIC 72 plus, sometimes 80, sometimes 65, whatever it may be. But ultimately, the concrete slab will have a performance on its own and they're not always shooting the same rating in all applications. The underlay is another component to take into account and the floor. So in this case, we have three components that all contribute to basically what the rating is going to be. The problem with that rating is ultimately, can we really achieve an AIIC 72 in hard surface flooring on a concrete slab as is? Absolutely not, because a concrete slab on its own can, to some extent, average shoot anywhere between 28 IIC on its own to 30 to 36. The average would probably be around the 30 32 range. So, of course, you can find 26 AIIC on the slab alone, nothing underneath, nothing on top. And then sometimes you'll see the odd slab that's going to be 36. So, the performance of the slab needs to be taken into consideration on what's the floor also. We also see people publicizing IICs versus, a, excuse me, AIICs. So ultimately, we need to kind of look at the fine prints. So IIC versus AIIC, AIIC is like comparing gas consumption or, in a car uh, between a highway driver and basically somebody driving in the city. That number is not the same because there's more stop and go in the city than there is on a highway. So we kind of need to, to some extent, compare apples to apples and also, Guys, we are always going to be testing a floor ceiling assembly. A rating cannot be associated to a product. So if I take this underlay, if I use it in a concrete slab, it's going to have a rating associated with it as far as the assembly is concerned. But if I take this and I use it in a completely different environment, I'm going to be completely somewhere else. So this is extremely important and in the middle of a lot of misperception, a lot of misunderstanding how this world actually works. So is it plausible that an actual underlay with a hardwood or laminate or strap, whatever it may be, on a slab will in reality shoot 54? I can tell you that it could shoot 47 and I can tell you it could shoot 62 depending on what the components are. Extremely important to associate a rating to an assembly, not to a product. I want to touch on Delta for a minute. Delta is technically supposed to um, isolate the performance of a product. The challenge with Delta is, the Delta, just so everyone is on the same page and understand what I'm referring to. The Delta, for example, if we want to try to identify the Delta, the underlay that's actually on uh, underneath the floor without the slab. Yes, if you test the floor directly over top of the slab, you're going to get a rating. Let's assume that that rating is 40. All of a sudden, you introduce an underlay and it shoots 60. You can associate the delta in that particular occasion that the delta was 20. That's great. <clears throat> the problem with that is if you take that same underlay that claims a delta of 20 and you apply it to a wood frame structure, or to a slab that's not as efficient. There's no way in the world that we can predict nor guarantee that the difference between using the underlay and not using it will claim a 20 improvement. So a delta is great because it does isolate the performance of a material, fair enough. But the bottom line is you can never get it outside of context. So we also, we always to some extent need to understand what's the assembly. There's no way around it. So once again, I invite everyone to always be cautious with the concept of the delta. There's nothing wrong with it. It just needs to be put in perspective. By the way, just so we understand uh, each other, I am not suggesting that underlayments, flooring, whatever components are not achieving the ratings that they're claiming. I want to make this clear. All I am saying is the question that we should ask ourselves is the how. So if I say to people out there right now that I golfed 78 last weekend, I wish, if I golf, golf 78 last week, and ultimately uh, I talk to one of you or I golf with one of you in a couple months, and ultimately I shoot 130, people are going to say, what's wrong? What's happened? Well, ultimately I may have got cut by the rain and I only played 11 holes. So for those of you that are familiar with golf, there's 18 holes in a round of golf. So I am not lying that I shot the ball 78 times. 
I'm just not telling you how many holes I've played. So if we get a little bit more agile and asking the questions, we're going to avoid a lot of issues in the long run. Okay. Now, some of you may be like wondering what's the difference between different ratings. So, you know, if I'm to be investing in a 60, what does that do versus a 50? So obviously extremely uh, difficult to answer, but I'm going to try to some extent to make you hear the difference between a 50, which is to some extent a minimum in the US, 55, which is a recommendation in Canada, and 60, which to some extent could be in some cases the expectation. So this is a moment of truth. Let's try to see if I can play this. So again, give me a second. It worked every single time, of course. Okay. By the way, I create my myself a card kit called "Get Out of Awkwardness for Free Card." So uh, I'm allowed. So I'm going to try this again. See if I can do it. Sorry, guys. Get with me. Yeah, no, for some reason that one doesn't want to play. So it happens, technology. So guys, um, I'm gonna have a couple more to play. If ever somebody wants to hear this after the webinar, please uh, reach out to me. I'll send you the landing page to all the sounds that I'm technically supposed to be playing today for you. But one of the things I do want to say, so at some point, uh, if you get a chance to get that landing page and, and test it out, what I want to tell you is the 50 and 60, the difference between the 10 dB here means that that building or that 60 would be twice as quiet as the one that shoots 50. So I have personally dealt with builders that were sitting in the high 40s acoustically and now they're shooting 60. And ultimately, the difference would be their building is twice as quiet. So every time we get like five points, every time we get 10 points, and it's not always that hard. It's using the right things at the right place that make a difference. Uh, you'd be shocked as far as uh, what improvement we can get. Okay. I want to talk to you guys about principles briefly. So five of them, I'm going to focus on a couple. So the presence of mass in a building, the presence of resilience and decoupling, which is huge in the flooring industry, void treatment, ceiling and franking. Void treatment, just so you know, is all about bad insulation in the ceiling. So how important it is to slow down the STC. As far as ceiling, uh, which is basically wherever air can pass, so can sound. So be very careful with like air vents and things like that or space under the doors. So these are very important, not as much related to flooring. So that's why I'm going to focus on the first few. So mass. Mass does two things in a building. It helps greatly with the STC. As a matter of fact, that's what it's for. So more mass you've got, better off you're going to be on the STC sound transmission class. So voices, my doors are shut right now because ultimately I don't want the sound to come in this room. So more you introduce density and mass between your ears and the voice of somebody else, better off you're going to be. That's why a concrete structure is always super efficient uh, on an STC. The second thing is flanking. Heavier something is, heavier a structure is, better off you're going to be when it comes to, uh, to flanking, meaning the vibration is not going to, to some extent, uh, vibrate as much within the whole building so it helps a lot on that front so you always need some mass within your structure resilience and decoupling resilience and decoupling is is by far the most neglected principle in the acoustic industry on a new and existing building so in a nutshell resilience and decoupling means is make things not touch each other so unlike the stc the iic loves to go from dense material to dense material so if you use a hard surface floor versus carpet, you're introducing something that's super hard that you're going to basically put over top a hard substrate. Sometimes there's no underlay, sometimes there's one, and that underlay may even be hard. So you end up with different components on top of each other. And the IIC is like electricity. It's like thermal. It needs a bridge. It needs a physical conductor in order to transfer from one thing to another. So when we think about this, Ultimately, if we would find a way to basically levitate a floor covering, whatever it is, over top, whatever the substrate is, that vibration would not naturally jump from one component to another. So what we're trying to do is, if we would 
apply the principle of resilience and decoupling as many times as we can, sometimes we only have one shot at it, we would be in an amazing, amazing place. But often that's not what happens. We end up with hard floor, over top hard substrate or hard underlay, over top a hard uh, basically concrete slab or wood frame structure, and the vibration finds its way down to the unit below. So that's what you're kind of seeing here on the graph. Even, for example, on a uh, wood frame structure, this is single home on the left side. Obviously, the energy is going to go somewhere. The one in the middle is if you introduce gypcrete or concrete topping, fair enough. It's going to help for STC, and it's going to help for flanking a little bit. But on the resilience and decoupling, it's not sufficient on its own. On the third one, you can see what happens when you introduce a chuck. You introduce something that's going to reduce the transfer of that vibration between hard uh, components. And you can, with that principle, do incredible, incredible things. Andre, can I ask a question? Please. Yes, sir. Uh, this is an opportunity to for the floor coverers out there, the salespeople, the A and D reps, everybody who has uh, you know flooring interest in this. Um, understand, uh, it's an opportunity to underline the difference between glue down flooring versus floating floors. It's constantly, uh, well, you know, which one's better for sound transfers? And this that's is what we're kind of talking about here. Maybe that's just that's um, a very good question. question. Uh, yeah. I will, I will touch on that in the next few slides when I talk about different floor coverings. I'll certainly, uh, I'll certainly touch on that, Chris. I appreciate you asking the question. Okay. Um, Chris, I might try to shut your... Okay, so now, uh, other principle I wanna show you is flanking. Flanking is, is to, in a nutshell, kind of the same idea, is to try to avoid products to touch each other and create a bridge. In the flooring industry, it's huge. So I want you to look at that graph is we can work with architects, we can work with condo boards and property management companies all we want. But ultimately, if the flooring is touching the baseboard and touching the wall, we're creating a weak, we're creating a leak, a leak. We're creating a bridge for the vibration to some people that walk in here and all of a sudden they're, they're, that, that vibration is going to bridge to something else. And then ultimately we're going to end up in trouble. So it's not only for expansion joints, that we technically, it's extremely important to make sure the floor covering is not, or even the, the additional substrate, if there's one, to not touch the walls because you're creating that bridge and that's what we're trying to avoid in a nutshell, okay? Uh, I'm gonna give this another try. I want, to, I want you to experience what decoupling really means, a vibration that all of a sudden we're bridging, how it can amplify sound. So I'm giving this a second try, let's see. Here we go, this one. So, as we can see, or as we can hear, the only difference on the music box between uh, playing in the air and playing on the wall is ultimately creating a bridge, and all of a sudden that bridge creates more flanking, and that flanking gets amplified. So I want you all to imagine when we're doing floor ceiling assemblies or flooring insulation, how important it is to actually not create that, okay? Uh, let's get the structure types for a bit, and we're going to get to the actual flooring. We'll share as much as we can. It's extremely important, guys, to understand that each structures that we're going to be dealing with has a different identity. They, they perform differently on their own. So when we are showing up as flooring contractors, flooring manufacturers, flooring industry as a whole, very important to understand that we're coming in with something that's already there. We're coming in with, we need to adjust our approach to the structure that we're working on because as a whole, they don't have the same low frequency performance. They don't have the same high frequency performance. As an example, example, this is a floor, so ultimately low frequency, you may not hear it, but high frequency. So understanding if one building is going to be more prone to low frequency or high frequency is huge. 
because all of a sudden we're going to use the treatment that's going to be the best suited for that particular application. So honestly, I don't believe, nor does my, business, my company believe that there's one product that does it all. There's no way that one underlay can do as good of a job in every single structure with every single assemblies out there. Because ultimately the building and the structure and how it's going to perform on SEC, IIC, low and high frequencies, if you learn to navigate through this a little bit and get some guidance to do that, we can do incredible things. And honestly, guys, sometimes it's not even more expensive. It's just a matter of using the right thing. Okay. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly here as uh, time is uh, uh, moving on. So uh, very quickly to understand, I kind of touched on this a little bit before, a concrete structure, obviously extremely efficient when it comes to the STC because of the mass and the density. So for those of you not familiar with this, an eight inch slab on its own with nothing underneath, nothing on top, will be well over the 55 recommended STC. So there's not really anything else that people need to pay attention to. Uh, different thicknesses, different framing levels will influence the performance overall. But I think the key to this is this. When you are working in a condo or an apartment building, whatever it may be, and you are working on a concrete, a concrete structure, extremely important to understand that we have one shot at doing it right on the decoupling. You have a floor, you have an underlay when there's one, and you have a slab. One shot. There's usually no ceiling. So ultimately, why not do the best job that we can underneath that floor over top of that slab? That's obviously that's what we're trying to do. I'm not suggesting everybody needs to shoot for the stars. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting sometimes to question what we're actually going to use in that particular case. Other thing with high frequency uh, and low frequency on concrete slab. Concrete slab is so heavy that it performs very, very well on the low frequency, but it's lacking on performance on the high frequency and the high yields. So it's irrelevant or not as good of an idea to use an underlay, for example, that's going to perform better on low frequency if you're already covered within that curve, within that, uh, within the, the, to some extent, the acoustic report you get. So may as well try to compensate for what we're lacking on the high frequency. So there are technologies out there that perform better over the top concrete slab because of the nature of the underlay. And ultimately, they're not necessarily more expensive. But ironically, when you end up on a lightwood frame building, it may be completely opposite because you are lighter on a lightwood frame building. So ultimately, you may need to compensate and use something that may be a little bit heavier. Okay, guys. Very simple, all about the right product at the right place, okay? So I'm gonna say that multiple times. Steel structure extremely quickly, very similar to concrete. So it's a steel deck and there's all usually a concrete slab on top of it, four inches, an example. Uh, very prone to flanking because there's metal involved. Ceiling is extremely important. Obviously, you're pretty good on STC. Also, one shot at doing it right on the decoupling. Um, lightwood frame, completely different animal. Uh, lightwood frame are more porous, they're lighter by nature. Usually why people add a concrete topping or gypcrete is to basically uh, help with the STC. So by adding mass, as we saw a little bit earlier, you're compensating for the lack of mass you have in the building in the first place. So you're in a better place on the flanking and on the STC. Once again, extremely important to understand that the lightwood frame building is going to be prone to vibration more because it's lighter. Um, also, using the right product at the right place. As an example, we have different things out there that we can promote or talk about. It's never the same if you're concrete than lightwood frame. Why is that? Because one on the lane can be really uh, much better than something else on the concrete, but the other way around when you're working on lightwood frame for the reason I said earlier. Okay? Mass timber, you guys are going to start seeing this. Mass timber is an amazing uh, structure. It's gaining a lot in popularity, but it also has its challenges, especially acoustic, acoustically. Usually people want to see the exposed mass timber or CLT or MPP or NLT. So you'll sometimes want, people will want to see the ceiling underneath. So the wood, wood slab, the challenge with that is the slab on its own is not as efficient as the same thickness made of concrete. And we're not adding, we're not adding a ceiling. So we can only sound insulate that structure from the top. So that's even more important to do a really good job on top, not to end up in the uh, numbers we talked about before, well below the uh, either expectations. 
recommendations or requirements. Okay. Let's talk about underlayment, which is the core uh, of this all. I'm not here to talk up or down anything because that's not even how that works anyways. So I'm just gonna touch on that briefly. Uh, there's techn techn technologies available out there. Cork as an example, rubber, textile, foam. There's a huge variety of systems out there. It is all about using the right product at the right place. I think I've touched on that enough. Uh, mind you, I could give you a quick example that if you're asking someone, what's the best uh, car you can drive? Well, if you're pulling a boat or a trailer, it might be a pickup truck. And if you're a student going to school downtown, Vancouver, New York, uh, San Francisco, wherever it may be, well, a pickup truck is definitely not the right uh, vehicle for you. So what's the key to this? It depends what you're doing with it. So the right product at the right place goes a long ways. And to make sure that we're capable of seeing re relevant data, it linked with your particular building. So if you are working on a concrete building, make sure the data is relevant to the actual assembly that you're dealing with. There's also, for you uh, floor contractors, floor manufacturers out there, there's gonna be new substrates. So be aware of new ways to do things, particularly on uh, mass timber and on lightwood frame buildings, where all of a sudden there's gonna be no concrete or gypcrete. There's gonna be, uh, whether it's mass timber or lightwood frame. So the compatibility between the flooring and the actual new substrate is gonna be key. Uh, we're already in touch with multiple people on, on making sure that uh, no one's going to be kind of surprised at what's going on on that front. Other factors to consider, mechanical stability, thickness, vapor barrier, longevity, warranty. So I'll leave it up to you to basically uh, do your homework on that front. Uh, underlayment versus STC. Let's, let's break a myth pretty quick here. An STC, uh, we already point out the fact that you should not, or we should not ask to some extent, for a IIC for an underlayment where we're doing a renovation job, at least we should try to find data or relevant data that is reasonable within the building that you're at. Um, so we should be cautious with that. But I can tell you that's even worse when I see a spec for an underlayment that needs to provide our STC rating. Let's make this uh, simple. There's no such thing as an underlayment that's going to really change anything on the STC with any assembly because. STC is all about the density. It's all about the weight, so the mass. So we understand a two mil foam or two mil rubber or two mil uh, whatever is not gonna change the game on the STC whatsoever. So we probably shouldn't ask for ratings that way, but that's even more true with the STC. So the structure is really what's going to give you a performance or an efficiency or a rating on the STC front. Um, acoustic adhesives versus, uh, you know, I hear a lot about acoustic adhesives. I just want to talk about this for literally 35 seconds. Acoustic adhesives, any acoustic adhesive or any adhesives will be acoustic by definition because technically it's softer than, than, than the substrate or it's harder than the floor. But the fact is, can you or can we claim or assume that gluing down our engineer hardwood directly over top of concrete slab will give you the same decoupling as using an underlay or using any underlay? Absolutely not. Is it plausible that it's going to happen? That you're going to see one data because you had a really efficient slab with a very efficient floor? Absolutely. I'm not denying the fact that it's plausible. But at the end, if we see it once every 10 times that there's a test, once again, I would suggest we read on the fine prints. Uh, as an example, Acoustic Tech, we have adhesives, but we never associate acoustic ratings to them because ultimately we, we wouldn't want people to think that by doing a single glue down, they'll end up in the same place and by doing a decoupling uh, double glue down. So that's just an example and it's a personal opinion. If you don't agree, we can have a conversation after the fact, um, I'd be okay with that. Uh, I'm gonna go to floor covering and it's gonna be almost basically the, uh, the end, so we're at 11.44. So I wanna go quickly on the different floor coverings, what we found out, what we've seen, uh, carpet, no one's going to learn anything new here. It's best for IIC because of resilience. So it's obviously more resilience. It's obviously, um, you know, softer. So it's going to perform more on IIC. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is usually if you're comparing the same assembly with carpet versus hard surface floor, you can't match 
the performance on IIC of carpet or the hard surface floor unless you would create a really, really big buildup over top of the subfloor is, I'm talking in renovation. So property management companies or uh, counterboards, let's be cautious with, it's impossible. You can't have the same performance of a hard surface floor than you do with a carpet. Second thing, carpet is great for IIC, but if, for example, there's no mass anywhere, it's not going to add anything on the STC. So you're not going to solve your problem on the STC by using carpet. It's going to be great for IIC, but not necessarily for the STC. Uh, engineer hardwood, uh, Lam and I'll kind of put them together. Floor or glued on the engineer hardwood. Very easy to decouple. Uh, double glue down can perform extremely well. Uh, floated uh, on this engineer can perform extremely well. Um, the mechanical stability, because they're usually thicker floors, uh, is usually not problematic. Actually, super easy and smooth. Uh, again, need the right underlayment. Needs the right underlayment, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and Chris, I will get to your question uh, right away. So the laminate floor, you have no choice but to use an underlay when you're doing a laminate floor. So if you're, you're doing a basement, you need an underlay anyways, but it is not the same situation And if you're doing a condo building or if you're doing a retrofit uh, on a six story. So even though you must use an underlay, sometimes choosing the right underlay is gonna go a long ways. You are correct, Chris, to some extent, if you're comparing a double glue down engineer versus a laminate, in theory, you would think that the floated application will be a little bit more efficient than a glue down one because there's more air between the components. On the other hand, I've multiple times seen a laminate floor over top an underlay, and all of a sudden, the engineer double glue down with the right underlay outperformed the floated application. So once again, there's no direct path. We can't draw conclusions out of the gate. There's a lot of different range of performance within the, the flooring itself and also the underlay. So there's ways to do great jobs for both, and there's ways for one to be more efficient than the other at any given point. Um, again, one quick point on the laminate. Uh, Acoustical, an acoustical membrane is by definition an underlay, but underlay is not by definition an acoustical membrane. So we got to be a little careful with, uh, to some extent, what it's actually designed to do. Vinyl planks, super trendy, very popular, can also be floated or glued depending on the skew, uh, scratch and water resistance. So there's obviously a lot of advantages to it to some extent. Uh, our experience with it, uh, it's a very dense floor. So it certainly transfer noise, uh, you know, it can transfer noise quite drastically because of its density. There's still a way to do a really good job on the acoustics with it. Sometimes there's a backing, sometimes there's not. Uh, I think the biggest challenge is a combination between acoustics and mechanical stability. What I mean by that is softer something is, to some extent, just to keep it simple, better off you're gonna be on the IIC transfer. The problem with that is softer the underlay is, then more mechanical stability issues you may run into. So sometimes that's why, for example, for us, we ask for a certain thickness of the floor. So people have choices to make. What is going to, what's more important to you? The acoustic performance of the assembly or uh, to some extent, everything else that the vinyl floor is gonna bring. So ultimately, uh, I've seen jobs where they add in another underlay underneath the cork or foam back LVT. And I've seen times where people glue directly down to the concrete. Uh, bear with me here for one second. I want to move this. Ceramic tile. Ceramic tile, obviously, extremely hard. The one thing I'll say about it is it, because it's so dense, it's by far the most problematic uh, uh, flooring type for IIC because it's going to conduct sound like no tomorrow. So same assembly, ceramic tile versus anything else. Ceramic tile will never, never match the efficiency of anything else because it's harder by four, five, six IIC often. Uh, we're going to see. So that's why very rarely on concrete slab, just to use as an example, will you see any performance over 55 with ceramic tile. And 55 is actually amazing with ceramic tile, where you can, to some extent, achieve that fairly easily with any other floor covering to some extent. Okay. Uh, Chris, did I answer your question? Yes, you, yes, you did. It's interesting because this was probably 15 years ago where I was involved in a high rise multi-family setting and I was quite convinced that the glue down, double glue down to a six mil rubber uh, was going to give us a better IIC transference to suites down below and we proved through a tapping tapping block test 
uh, an engineer was brought in, we proved that actually the floating floor method was going to be better in that circumstance. So it's interesting that you underline the fact that it can be either way. It's all about the substrate and and the ceiling and uh, it, all these components play a, a very important role, which is I think what is so important about your message. It goes beyond the floor covering system. And that's an important takeaway here. It, it, it's huge, Chris. At the end, if you and I once again go golfing, there's one course because it's, for example, narrower and you're better on the short game, you might absolutely kick my butt. And ultimately, if we go somewhere else where, you know, to some extent, the long game is a little bit better, maybe I'm going to kick your butt. So ultimately, the bottom line is it's all about the conditions in which you're working. So you're correct. So very difficult to draw any conclusion, not to make it more complicated, but you're correct. This, we got to be we got to be careful with that for sure. OK, so quickly, it's 1150. Uh, see, we have most most people. So I promise you I'll breeze through this in the next couple of minutes. I want to make you hear two things. There's a myth out there that says bare concrete slab is amazing for sound. Yeah, it's great for low frequency. It's great for STC. But when it gets to uh, the uh, high frequency, um, basically, you'll see the difference. So what I would like you guys to do is uh, turn your sound down a little bit at home because uh, that one is a little loud for sure, okay? Bear with me here. Go. So the point of this is basically to show you this. There's no nothing bad about LBT. There's nothing wrong with it. Bottom line is, if you, for example, want to know what an LBT sounds like directly over top concrete, there was barely any difference between the two sounds. All of a sudden, you introduce a decoupler between them, and that vibration's got nowhere to go. So I thought it'd be interesting to kind of make you hear this. And those are real, real recordings. Okay. Um, Assemblies, I'm reasoning through this like uh, no tomorrow. Just want to show you a little bit sometimes what it looks like. So what we're, uh, what what options or what uh, ratings can be achievable. Concrete slab, typical wood frame. We can do incredible things. All of a sudden with the IIC, some people think that it's impossible to perform better than concrete or light wood frame building. Well, I've got news for you. Uh, it's, it's possible to do it by playing with the components and applying the right principles. Uh, same thing also with systems that will completely get rid of the gypcrete or concrete topping. There are ways to do, excuse me, to do that. So uh, again, things to explore. We're going to start seeing some new ways. It's already happening. Uh, same thing with mass timber. Mass timber has a lot of different options out there with and without concrete topping. So if ever you're working on anything, steel structure. Um, it's 11:52, so I'll leave you with a couple things, and then uh, if uh, Chris, you want to. To some extent, how the last word will uh, will go from there. So, a couple of things. Um, acoustic, as we saw, it requires specific attention. It's important. IIC ratings always of an assembly. If we follow the principles and understand them, we can really avoid issues, or to some extent, even uh, even uh, avoid issues for sure, or, or even solve problems. Read the fine prints. Let's try to be a little bit more on the red flags or how was this tested with what. The right product at the right place cannot stress that enough. Better acoustics. Guys, we see it every day. Acoustics has become a major, major concern. You guys know this uh, from architects, developers, uh, obviously, board, property management companies. So we're all dealing with this whether we want it or not. So having a little bit more knowledge about it, understanding a little bit more what to ask and what to look into or look for uh, is going to go a long ways. And I want to leave you with some thoughts. What are the requirements versus the expectations? Again, the requirements in Canada, as an example, or even in the US, which are very low on the low 50, there's a difference between the two. People are expecting peace and comfort. They're, that's what they're expecting. So do we only need two? We can, but do we only need to meet the requirements or can to some extent add some added value to meet the expectations? Second, what is our responsibility in the flooring industry? To some extent, it's got to be our responsibility to some extent to change the game and to some extent stop the spin and the, 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 
the vicious circle that, that we're on. How do we truly contribute to a better environment for the occupants? So I'm leaving you with these thoughts on how we can do that. There's, there's a ton of ways that we can do that. And I think one of them, Chris, you tell me if I'm wrong, was to basically try to understand first and foremost, how this world works, how this animal works. And then ultimately we can decide corporately or individually what we're willing to do about it. Couple add-ons before I give the, uh, the mic to Chris for the last word. Uh, add-ons, if any of you are interested in uh, seeing all bunch of different assemblies and, and possibilities on all kinds of structures, uh, we have a bunch of different acoustical recipe books, whether it's for mass timber, steel, light with frame, concrete, or all of them. Uh, we also have a program called Acousti Index that's not about putting our products first and foremost. It's, it's ultimately to try to find out what the options are. Acoustic Condo, I know Chris has been uh, aware of what this program is about. Acoustic Condo is in a nutshell designed for the property management companies and the condo boards to try to assist them and accompany them in making the right recommendations for their building so it's customized and we loop that in with the floor manufacturers and flooring contractors locally. So there's a lot of power within that program to try to change the game. And obviously, if any of you have any questions, any concern with the past hour, uh, anything you'd like to chat about, uh, obviously, I'm more than happy to do so. If ever uh, you are not in Western Canada, still reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with either Christian or my team out east. Uh, wherever you are, we'll make sure that we answer your questions and, uh, and go from there. Uh, so I will not, because it's 11.56, I won't go to Q&A because either way it's a little tricky. But again, email me or email us and then we'll be more than happy to, uh, to assist you. Chris, last word. Yes, well, thank you, Andre. Again, great stuff. As you can see, for those of you who are remaining on this webinar still here, you, the level of detail with just this subject is uh, is is impressive and uh, it's difficult to get to grips with. I mean, if you're an architect or if you're a general contractor, unfortunately for you folks, uh, construction kind of expects you to know everything about everything. And I, I just don't know how you, you folks do your job. It's really tough. So in order to just dial into a subject like this, and get the um, the facts. You need to talk to the experts, and uh, this is how we support each other in construction and um, move together as a team to get the right job done at the end of a complex process. Um, we're going to be putting more of this stuff out on our. Uh, you can get access to it on our website. I've given you the URL earlier, um, nfca.ca. There's an education tab, and um, for example, next uh, on the 13th of May, I think that's a Wednesday. Um, there is a, a seminar, it's going out at no cost, uh, all you've got to do is register and request your invite and that's on the subject of understanding and preventing floor covering failure. Uh, our mission is to get the specifications right, specifications drive contracts and actions on site. If we have the wrong spec, it's not good for anybody involved, so at least minimum standards for floor coverings can be found in documents and we remove that tendency to, to cut and paste old specs into current projects, which uh, they just don't add up because today's products are very different from they were from what they were even you know 10 years ago. So uh, with that said, Andre, I'd like to thank you very much. Fantastic information. Um, and uh, to everybody else out there, stay well, um, and uh, we will talk to you on the next seminar. And yeah, that's, stay safe. And for those of you still on the call, we're going to put in a couple other webinars coming out in the next couple of weeks. So if you're interested in one of which is on mass timber, the other one's going to be on dry topping. So options uh, to some extent are the new kind of innovative ways to do things that we've talked about. So if you're interested, you'll see, uh, keep an eye out for, uh, for that email to, to, to be sent out. And thank you again. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks again, Chris. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andre. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.